Read 180 Audiobooks presents Night by Elie Wiesel. Before you start reading, let me tell you a little about the book. When the author was just 15 years old, he lived through one of the most horrible events in human history. Night is the true story of his experiences. First, some background. In 1933, Adolf Hitler was elected leader of Germany. At the time, the German economy was in a terrible depression and the country had lots of problems. Hitler and his political party, the Nazis, blamed these problems on the Jews and passed law after law stripping Jews of their rights. Jews were not allowed to vote. They couldn't go to public school. They couldn't go to movie theaters or the beach. In some places, Jews couldn't even walk down the street. In time, the Nazis began rounding up Jews and other minorities and locking them up in prisons called concentration camps, where they were beaten, starved, forced into slave labor, and even put to death. In 1939, World War II began when Hitler invaded and took over the country of Poland. The German armies went on to conquer most of the rest of Europe. Wherever Hitler's armies went, Jews were rounded up and sent into camps. During World War II, Elie Wiesel was a young Jewish boy living in a part of Romania called Transylvania. In the spring of 1944, Transylvanian Jews, such as Elie and his family, were rounded up and deported to concentration camps in other countries. About a year later, World War II came to an end in Europe. England, the United States, and their allies defeated Germany and set free the prisoners in the concentration camps. But by that time, six million European Jews, along with gypsies, gay people, and other minorities, had died in the camps. Many died from hunger and disease. Most were gassed or shot to death by the Nazis. Elie Wiesel was among those who survived the horrors of life in the camps, but his life and his world would never be the same. To hear his story in his own words, turn to page one in your books and get ready to follow along as you listen. But first, here's a word from your reading coach. Hi, my name is Louise and I'll be reading this book with you. During the story, I'll pop in from time to time to make sure we don't miss anything important. I'll also show you some things I do when I come across a difficult word or a confusing part of the book. Let me warn you about something up front. When I started reading this book, I thought I'd never finish it. There were many words I didn't know and many places and names I had never heard of. But as I got further into the book, things became easier to understand. It's a book I'll never forget about people who suffered so much, including some, like the author, who lived to tell their stories. You're going to read about some strange and frightening things in this book about a young Jewish boy's experience of the Holocaust. But maybe you can imagine how you would have felt in his shoes. And if you think the story is as sad as I do, then maybe you'll tell your friends about it. Only by knowing about the horrible things that happened in the past can we prevent them from ever happening again. Okay, let's start reading on page one. Don't forget to follow along in your book as you listen to the recording. Night by Elie Wiesel They called him Moisha the Beetle, as though he had never had a surname in his life. He was a man of all work at a Hasidic synagogue. The Jews of Seget, that little town in Transylvania where I spent my childhood, were very fond of him. He was very poor and lived humbly. Generally, my fellow townspeople, though they would help the poor, were not particularly fond of them. Moisha the Beetle was the exception. Nobody ever felt embarrassed by him. Nobody ever felt encumbered by his presence. He was a past master in the art of making himself insignificant, of seeming invisible. Okay, this guy Moshe must be important because he's the first character in the book. We just learned that he is a man of all work, which is like saying that he's a handyman. He does whatever jobs need to be done at the synagogue, the place where the Jewish villagers go to pray. The villagers like Moshe and treat him differently from other poor people whom they usually feel uncomfortable being around. No one wants to be poor, and sadly, it's hard sometimes to be reminded that others need help. Let's read on. We're on the second paragraph, which begins, Physically, he was as awkward. Physically, he was as awkward as a clown. He made people smile with his waif-like timidity. I loved his great, dreaming eyes. 
their gaze lost in the distance. He spoke little. He used to sing, or rather, to chant. Such snatches as you could hear told of the suffering of the divinity, of the exile of Providence, who, according to the Kabbalah, awaits his deliverance in that of man. I got to know him toward the end of 1941. I was twelve. I believed profoundly. During the day I studied the Talmud, and at night I ran to the synagogue to weep over the destruction of the temple. One day I asked my father to find me a master to guide me in my studies of the Kabbalah. You're too young for that. Maimonides said it was only at thirty that one had the right to perilous world of mysticism. You must first study the basic subjects within your own understanding. So what do we know so far about the narrator? We know that he's only twelve, but he's very serious about his religion and wants to find out as much as he can about its history and its teachings. He studies the Talmud, the ancient book of Jewish laws that will show him how to be a good person. When he prays at the synagogue, he thinks about the destruction of the temple, which the Jewish people built around 2,000 years ago in a city called Jerusalem as their first place of worship. Another group of people, the Romans, ruled Jerusalem at the time, and they destroyed the temple out of fear and hatred of people who were different from them. The young boy is also interested in the Kabbalah, an advanced form of teaching that some Jews have used to understand the mysteries of God and man, but his father warns him to be patient and first learn the basics. Now let's see what else we can discover about these characters. Keep reading near the top of page two. We're on the sentence that begins, My father was a cultured... My father was a cultured, rather unsentimental man. There was never any display of emotion, even at home. He was more concerned with others than with his own family. The Jewish community in Seget held him in the greatest esteem. They often used to consult him about public matters and even about private ones. There were four of us children, Hilda, the eldest, then B, I was the third and the only son. The baby of the family was Zipora. My parents ran a shop. Hilda and B helped them with the work. As for me, they said my place was at school. There aren't any Kabbalists at Seget, my father would repeat. He wanted to drive the notion out of my head, but it was in vain. I found a master for myself, Moisha the Beetle. He had noticed me one day at dusk when I was praying. Why do you weep when you pray? He asked me, as though he had known me a long time. I don't know why, I answered, greatly disturbed. Well, the question had never entered my head. I wept because, because of something inside me that felt the need for tears. That was all I knew. Why do you pray? He asked me after a moment. Why did I pray? A strange question. Why did I live? Why did I breathe? I don't know why, I said, even more disturbed and ill at ease. I don't know why. After that day I saw him often. He explained to me with great insistence that every question possessed a power that did not lie in the answer. Man raises himself toward God by the questions he asks him, he was fond of repeating. That is the true dialogue. Man questions God and God answers, but we don't understand his answers. We can't understand them because they come from the depths of the soul. They stay there until death. You will find the true answers, Eliezer, only within yourself. And why do you pray, Moisha? I asked him. I pray to the God within me that he will give me the strength to ask him the right questions. We talked like this nearly every evening. We used to stay in the synagogue after all the faithful had left, sitting in the gloom where a few half-burned candles still gave a flickering light. One evening I told him how unhappy I was because I could not find a master in Seget to instruct me in the Zohar, the Kabbalistic books, the secrets of Jewish mysticism. He smiled indulgently. After a long silence, he said, There are a thousand and one gates leading into the orchard of mystical truth. Every human being has his own gate. We must never make the mistake of wanting to enter the orchard by any gate but our own. 
To do this is dangerous for the one who enters and also for those who are already there. And Moisha the beetle, the poor barefoot of Siget, talked to me for long hours of the revelations and mysteries of the Kabbalah. It was with him that my initiation began. We would read together ten times over the same page of the Zohar, not to learn it by heart, but to extract the divine essence from it. And throughout those evenings, a conviction grew in me that Moisha the beetle would draw me with him into eternity, into that time where question and answer would become one. Now we know a lot more about the boy. He has three sisters, his parents own a shop, and his name is Eliezer. Did you notice that the author's name is Eli? Since we know that this book, Night, is an autobiography, we can guess that Eli is the nickname for Eliezer. We also learn that Eli's father is a respected man in the community who often gives advice to others. Sometimes Eli's father seems distant from his own family, though, and so Eli turns to Moshe, that man who works in the synagogue. Moshe sees how important religion is to Eli, so important that Eli will study it against his father's wishes, and he agrees to help Eli with his prayers. Moshe tells Eli that the main thing is to keep asking God questions, even if there are no answers or if the answers are not always clear. Only in this way can Eli discover what it means to have faith. Let's keep going. Pick up after the space near the bottom of page 3, where it says, Then one day... Then one day they expelled all the foreign Jews from Siget, and Moshe the beetle was a foreigner. Crammed into cattle trains by Hungarian police, they wept bitterly. We stood on the platform and wept too. The train disappeared on the horizon. It left nothing behind but its thick, dirty smoke. I heard a Jew behind me heave a sigh. What can we expect? He said. It's war. The deportees were soon forgotten. A few days after they had gone, people were saying that they had arrived in Galicia, were working there, and were even satisfied with their lot. Several days passed, several weeks, several months. Life had returned to normal. A wind of calmness and reassurance blew through our houses. The traders were doing good business, the students lived buried in their books, and the children played in the streets. Eli describes how Moshe and the other foreign Jews are forced to leave his town. He refers to them as deportees, which means a group of people who are driven out of an area or a country for a particular reason. Deportation sometimes happens as a result of war, and I remember from the introduction that Europe, including Transylvania, where Eli lives, is in the middle of World War II. I'm not sure yet exactly when this part of the story takes place, but we know from the first page that it's at least the end of 1941, which means that the war has been going on for a while. So it's strange that nothing bad or frightening seems to have happened in this town until now, and the fact that the people return so calmly to their daily lives and don't seem concerned about protecting themselves makes me worry about what's going to happen next. I'm also worried about what will happen to the deportees. Okay, let's continue from the fourth paragraph on page four, starting with, One day, as I was just going into the synagogue... One day, as I was just going into the synagogue, I saw, sitting on a bench near the door, Moisha the beetle. He told his story and that of his companions. The train full of deportees had crossed the Hungarian frontier and on Polish territory had been taken in charge by the Gestapo. There it had stopped. The Jews had to get out and climb into lorries. The lorries drove toward a forest. The Jews were made to get out. They were made to dig huge graves. And when they had finished their work, the Gestapo began theirs. Without passion, without haste, they slaughtered their prisoners. Each one had to go up to the hole and present his neck. Babies were thrown into the air and machine gunners used them as targets. This was in the forest of Galicia near Colomay. How had Moisha the beetle escaped? Miraculously, he was wounded in the leg and taken for dead. Through long days and nights, he went from one Jewish house to another, telling the story of Malka, the young girl who had taken three days to die, 
and of Tobias the tailor who had begged to be killed before his sons. Well, it looks like we had good reason to worry about the deportees. Moshe escaped and returned to Seget, but the other foreign Jews were not so lucky, and the story that Moshe tells Eli about what happened to them is really horrible. When their train arrived in Poland, the Jews were forced into lorries, a lorry is what British people call a truck, and driven to their death by the Gestapo, the German secret police force created by the Nazis. The Gestapo not only murdered all of the Jews in the middle of a forest, they even made the Jews dig their own graves, climb into them, and wait to be killed. It's shocking and also incredibly sad how, in such a short amount of time, the story has moved so far away from the quiet, peaceful days of Moshe and Eli's religious lessons. Let's continue near the bottom of page four, starting with the sentence, Moshe had changed. Moshe had changed. There was no longer any joy in his eyes. He no longer sang. He no longer talked to me of God or of the Kabbalah, but only of what he had seen. People refused not only to believe his stories, but even to listen to him. He's just trying to make us pity. The imagination he has, they said. Or even, poor fellow, he's gone mad. And as for Moshe, he wept. Jews, listen to me. It's all I ask of you. I don't want money or pity. Only listen to me. He would cry between prayers at dusk and the evening prayers. I did not believe him myself. I would often sit with him in the evening after the service, listening to his stories and trying my hardest to understand his grief. I felt only pity for him. They take me for a madman, he would whisper, and tears, like drops of wax, flowed from his eyes. Once I asked him this question. Why are you so anxious that people should believe what you say? In your place, I shouldn't care whether they believed me or not. He closed his eyes as though to escape time. You don't understand, he said in despair. You can't understand. I have been saved miraculously. I managed to get back here. Where did I get the strength from? I wanted to come back to Siget to tell you the story of my death so that you could prepare yourselves while there was still time. To live? I don't attach any importance to my life anymore. I'm alone. No, I wanted to come back and to warn you and see how it is no one will listen to me. That was toward the end of 1942. Afterward, life returned to normal. The London radio, which we listened to every evening, gave us heartening news. The daily bombardment of Germany, Stalingrad, preparation for the Second Front. And we, the Jews of Siget, were waiting for better days, which would not be long in coming now. I continued to devote myself to my studies. By day, the Talmud, at night, the Kabbalah. My father was occupied with his business and the doings of the community. My grandfather had come to celebrate the New Year with us so that he could attend the services of the famous Rabbi of Borsha. My mother began to think that it was high time to find a suitable young man for Hilda. Thus, the year 1943 passed by. Let's see. In this section we just finished, which takes place over the course of a year, Moshe keeps trying to warn the townspeople about what's going on in other parts of Europe. But no one, not even Ellie, will believe him. Why not? Let's think back to the beginning of the book when we first meet Moshe and learn that he's good at making himself seem invisible. Wouldn't you think that Moshe's refusal to be invisible now must mean that his story is really important and that the people of Siget should hear it? But sometimes people will only listen to what they want to hear. And in the same way that the townspeople don't like to be reminded of the poor, it seems that these people don't want to know about the terrible things that are happening to Jews elsewhere in Europe. They seem to be in serious denial about the war and prefer to live their lives cut off from the rest of the world. But what's going to happen if the rest of the world decides to come to them? 
Let's keep going. Begin reading near the top of page 6 with Spring 1944. Spring 1944. Good news from the Russian front. No doubt could remain now of Germany's defeat. It was only a question of time, of months or weeks perhaps. The trees were in blossom. This was a year like any other, with its springtime, its betrothals, its weddings and births. People said, the Russian army's making gigantic strides forward. Hitler won't be able to do us any harm even if he wants to. Yes, we even doubted that he wanted to exterminate us. Was he going to wipe out a whole people? Could he exterminate a population scattered throughout so many countries? So many millions? What methods could he use? And in the middle of the 20th century? It's spring, and the trees blossoming in Seget remind us that this is traditionally a season of new beginnings. The townspeople don't want to hear Moshe's story about digging graves. They want to think about life, not death. They also cannot believe what they hear about the Nazis wanting to wipe out a whole people. With what we know about Hitler's hatred for the Jews, we can guess that the whole people Eli refers to is the entire Jewish population of Europe, made up of millions of people in many different countries. And when Eli says, we even doubted that he wanted to exterminate us, I think that again, he's talking about not just the Jews from Seget, but the larger community of European Jews. To exterminate, then, must mean something much stronger than simply to kill. To exterminate means to destroy not just one or some, but every member of a particular group, in this case, the Jews. Let's read on, starting near the middle of page 6, with, Besides, people were interested. Besides, people were interested in everything, in strategy, in diplomacy, in politics, in Zionism, but not in their own fate. Even Moisha the Beetle was silent. He was weary of speaking. He wandered in the synagogue or in the streets with his eyes down, his back bent, avoiding people's eyes. At that time, it was still possible to obtain emigration permits for Palestine. I had asked my father to sell out, liquidate his business, and leave. I'm too old, my son, he replied. I'm too old to start a new life. I'm too old to start from scratch again in a country so far away. The Budapest radio announced that the fascist party had come into power. Horty had been forced to ask one of the leaders of the Nielash party to form a new government. Still, this was not enough to worry us. Of course, we had heard about the fascists, but they were still just an abstraction to us. This was only a change in the administration. The following day, there was more disturbing. With government permission, German troops had entered Hungarian territory. Here and there, anxiety was aroused. One of our friends, Berkowitz, who had just returned from the capital, told us, The Jews in Budapest are living in an atmosphere of fear and terror. There are anti-Semitic incidents every day in the streets, in the trains. The fascists are attacking Jewish shops and synagogues. The situation is getting very serious. This news spread like wildfire through Seget. Soon it was on everyone's lips, but not for long. Optimism soon revived. The Germans won't get as far as this. They'll stay in Budapest. There are strategic and political reasons. Before three days had passed, German army cars had appeared in our streets. Okay. Moshe, Eli, and the other Jews of Siget are hearing reports of Jews being attacked in Budapest, a big city in the neighboring country of Hungary. In 1944, the people of Hungary elected a fascist government, and this government took orders from the German Nazis. Nazi soldiers were allowed to enter Hungarian cities to terrorize the Jews and destroy their shops and synagogues. Eli is scared that the Nazis will soon enter Transylvania and do the same to the Jews of his village, and so he begs his father to sell their shop and move the family to Palestine, an area far away in the Middle East. Some Jews who called themselves Zionists 
had dreams of creating a Jewish nation in Palestine, the land where their ancestors had lived. But Ellie's father isn't a Zionist. He refuses to leave Siget, telling Ellie he's too old to start a new life somewhere else. With the Nazis on their way, you can imagine how disastrous this decision may be for Ellie's family. Let's see what happens next. Start reading after the space on page 7 with Anguish, German Soldiers. Anguish. German soldiers, with their steel helmets and their emblem, the Death's Head. However, our first impressions of the Germans were most reassuring. The officers were billeted in private houses, even in the homes of Jews. Their attitude toward their hosts was distant, but polite. They never demanded the impossible, made no unpleasant comments, and even smiled occasionally at the mistress of the house. One German officer lived in the house opposite ours. He had a room with the Kahn family. They said he was a charming man, calm, likable, polite, and sympathetic. Three days after he moved in, he brought Madame Kahn a box of chocolates. The optimists rejoiced. Well, there you are, you see. What did we tell you? You wouldn't believe us. There are your Germans. What do you think of them? Where is their famous cruelty? The Germans were already in the town. The fascists were already in power. The verdict had already been pronounced. Yet the Jews of Siget continued to smile. The week of Passover. The weather was wonderful. My mother bustled round her kitchen. There were no longer any synagogues open. We gathered in private houses. The Germans were not to be provoked. Practically every Rabbi's flat became a house of prayer. We drank, we ate, we sang. The Bible bade us rejoice during the seven days of the feast to be happy. But our hearts were not in it. Our hearts had been beating more rapidly for some days. We wished the feast were over so that we should not have to play this comedy any longer. On the seventh day of Passover, the curtain rose. The Germans arrested the leaders of the Jewish community. From that moment, everything happened very quickly. The race toward death had begun. The first step, Jews would not be allowed to leave their houses for three days on pain of death. Moisha the beetle came running to our house. I warned you, he cried to my father, and without waiting for a reply, he fled. That same day, the Hungarian police burst into all the Jewish houses in the street. A Jew no longer had the right to keep in his house gold, jewels, or any objects of value. Everything had to be handed over to the authorities on pain of death. My father went down into the cellar and buried our savings. At home, my mother continued to busy herself with her usual tasks. At times, she would pause and gaze at us, silent. When the three days were up, there was a new decree. Every Jew must wear the yellow star. Some of the prominent members of the community came to see my father, who had highly placed connections in the Hungarian police, to ask him what he thought of the situation. Perhaps he did not want my to disarm the My father did not consider it so grim in their wounds. The yellow star? Oh, well, what of it? You don't die of it. Poor father. Of what then did you die? But already they were issuing new decrees. We were no longer allowed to go into restaurants or cafes, to travel on the railway, to attend the synagogue, to go out into the street after six o'clock. Then came the ghetto. Two ghettos were set up in Siget, a large one in the center of town occupied four streets, and another smaller one extended over several small side streets in the outlying district. The street where we lived, Serpent Street, was inside the first ghetto. We still lived, therefore, in our own house. But as it was at the corner, the windows facing the outside street had to be blocked up. We gave up some of our rooms to relatives who had been driven out of their flats. Little by little, life returned to normal. The barbed wire which fenced us in did not cause any real fear. We even thought ourselves rather well off. We were entirely self-contained. 
a little Jewish republic, we appointed a Jewish council, a Jewish police, an office for social assistance, a labor committee, a hygiene department, a whole government machinery. Everyone marveled at it. We should no longer have before our eyes those hostile faces, those hate-laden stares. Our fear and anguish were at an end. We were living among Jews, among brothers. Of course, there were still some unpleasant moments. Every day the Germans came to fetch men to stoke coal on the military trains. There were not many volunteers for work of this kind. But apart from that, the atmosphere was peaceful and reassuring. The general opinion was that we were going to remain in the ghetto until the end of the war, until the arrival of the Red Army. Then everything would be as before. It was neither German nor Jew who ruled the ghetto. It was illusion. Okay, what does Eli mean when he writes that illusion ruled the ghetto? Well, I know that an illusion is sort of like a dream. It's when you believe something is true, but it's really not. So maybe Eli's talking about how the Jews in the ghetto keep telling themselves that everything's okay, when it seems pretty obvious that they are in serious trouble. I mean, look at everything that's happened to them. First, they were told they had to stay inside their homes, and anyone who left would be killed on sight. Then, the Jews were forced to give up their valuables, and the Hungarian police took away all their gold, their money, and their jewels. All Jews were made to wear yellow stars, identifying them as Jews and preventing them from eating in restaurants, riding on trains, and even praying in the synagogue. Eventually, they were rounded up and forced to live in ghettos, special areas surrounded by barbed wire fences to keep the Jews apart from the villagers who aren't Jewish. But even now, the Jews of Siget can't admit that their situation is getting really dangerous. Instead, they admire the government they have set up for themselves within the ghetto. Do you think this government has any real power? I don't see how it could. And how would you like to live in a ghetto and have all of your rights taken away from you? I think the Jews of Siget are definitely allowing illusion to rule when they tell themselves that soon everything's going to be just like it was before. Let's continue near the top of page 10, beginning with, On the Saturday before Pentecost. On the Saturday before Pentecost, in the spring sunshine, people strolled carefree and unheeding through the swarming streets. They chatted happily. The children played games on the pavements. With some of my schoolmates, I sat in the Ezra Malik Gardens, studying a treatise on the Talmud. Night fell. There were twenty people gathered in our backyard. My father was telling them anecdotes and expounding his own views on the situation. He was a good storyteller. Suddenly, the gate opened and Stern, a former tradesman who had become a policeman, came in and took my father aside. Despite the gathering dusk, I saw my father turn pale. What's the matter? We all asked him. I don't know. I've been summoned to an extraordinary meeting of the council. Something must have happened. The good story he had been in the middle of telling us was to remain unfinished. I'm going there, he went on. I shall be back as soon as I can. I'll tell you all about it. Wait for me. We were prepared to wait some hours. The backyard became like the hall outside an operating room. We were only waiting for the door to open to see the opening of the firmament itself. Other neighbors, having heard rumors, had come to join us. People looked at their watches. The time passed very slowly. What could such a long meeting mean? I've got a premonition of evil, said my mother. This afternoon I noticed some new faces in the ghetto. Two German officers from the Gestapo, I believe. Since we've been here, not a single officer has ever shown himself. Okay, do you remember the story that Moshe told the other villagers? The story of how the Gestapo murdered Jewish men, women, and children in the forest outside Hungary? Well now, for the first time, two German officers from the Gestapo have appeared inside the ghetto. When Ellie's mother sees them, she has a premonition of evil. A premonition must be a feeling or an instinct. 
She suspects that the officers will do something evil. And when Ellie's father leaves for an important meeting with the community leaders, other people in the ghetto feel fearful too, as they anxiously await his return. Let's see what Ellie's father has learned at the meeting. Start reading at the top of page 11. It was nearly midnight. No one had wanted to go to bed. A few people had paid a flying visit to their homes to see that everything was all right. Others had returned home, but they left instructions that they were to be told as soon as my father came back. At last the door opened, and he appeared. He was pale. At once he was surrounded. What happened? Tell us what happened. Say something. How avid we were at that moment for one word of confidence, one sentence to say that there were no grounds for fear, that the meeting could not have been more commonplace, more routine, that it had only been a question of social welfare, of sanitary arrangements. But one glance at my father's haggard face was enough. I have terrible news, he said at last. Deportation. The ghetto was to be completely wiped out. We were to leave street by street, starting the following day. We wanted to know everything, all the details. The news had stunned everyone, yet we wanted to drain the bitter draft to the dregs. Where are we being taken? This was a secret. A secret from all except one, the president of the Jewish council. But he would not say. He could not say. The Gestapo had threatened to shoot him if he talked. There are rumors going around, said my father in a broken voice, that we're going somewhere in Hungary to work in the brick factories. Uh, apparently the reason is that the front is too close here. After a moment's silence, he added, Each person will be allowed to take only his own personal belongings, a bag on our backs, some food, a few clothes, nothing else. Again, a heavy silence. Go and wake the neighbors up, said my father, so that they can get ready. The shadows beside me awoke as from a long sleep. They fled silently in all directions. Ellie's father tells the villagers to prepare for deportation, which means that they are being forced to leave their home. But even before we hear this news, we can guess that things must be getting serious. For one thing, it's almost midnight and no one has gone to sleep. That's pretty strange for a town where people have tried so hard to keep acting as though everything's okay. I think the villagers are finally beginning to admit that their lives are not really going to be normal anytime soon, if ever. The word deportation brings back frightening memories of Moshe's story. Ellie's father has heard that the deportees will be sent to work in Hungarian brick factories because Siget is too close to the front, which is an area where lots of fighting is taking place. But do you really think these people will be sent to work in factories, or are they going somewhere far worse? Let's read on. We're near the top of page 12, where it says, For a moment... For a moment, we were alone. Then suddenly, Batya Reich, a relative who was living with us, came into the room. There's someone knocking on the blocked-up window, the one that faces outside. It was not until after the war that I learned who it was that had knocked. It was an inspector in the Hungarian police, a friend of my father, before we went into the ghetto, he had said to us, Don't worry. If you're in any danger, I'll warn you. If he could have spoken to us that evening, we could perhaps have fled. But by the time we had managed to open the window, it was too late. There was no one outside. The ghetto awoke. One by one, lights came on in the windows. I went into the house of one of my father's friends. I woke up the head of the household, an old man with a gray beard and the eyes of a dreamer. He was stooped from long nights of study. Get up, sir, get up! You've got to get ready for the journey. You're going to be expelled from here tomorrow with your whole family and all the rest of the Jews. Where to? 
Don't ask me, sir. Don't ask me any questions. Only God could answer you. For heaven's sake, get up. He had not understood a word of what I was saying. He probably thought I had gone out of my mind. What tale is this? Get ready for the journey? What journey? Why? What's going on? Have you gone mad? Still half asleep, he stared at me with terror-stricken eyes as though he expected me to burst out laughing and say in the end, Go back to bed. Go to sleep. Pleasant dreams. Nothing's happened at all. It was just a joke. My throat was dry. The words choked in it, paralyzing my lips. I could not say any more. Then he understood. He got out of bed and with automatic movements began to get dressed. Then he went up to the bed where his wife slept and touched her brow with infinite tenderness. She opened her eyes, and it seemed to me that her lips were brushed by a smile. Then he went to his children's beds and woke them swiftly, dragging them from their dreams. I fled. Time passed very quickly. It was already four o'clock in the morning. My father ran to right and left, exhausted, comforting friends, running to the Jewish council to see if the edict had not been revoked in the meantime. To the very last moment, a germ of hope stayed alive in our hearts. The women were cooking eggs, roasting meat, baking cakes, and making knapsacks. The children wandered all over the place, hanging their heads, not knowing what to do with themselves, where to go, to keep from getting in the way of the grown-ups. Our backyard had become a real marketplace. Household treasures, valuable carpets, silver candelabra, prayer books, Bibles, and other religious articles littered the dusty ground beneath a wonderfully blue sky. Pathetic objects, which looked as though they had never belonged to anyone. By eight o'clock in the morning, a weariness like molten lead began to settle in the veins, the limbs, the brain. I was in the midst of my prayers when suddenly there were shouts in the street. I tore myself from my phylacteries and ran to the window. Hungarian police had entered the ghetto and were shouting in the neighboring street, All Jews outside! Hurry! Some Jewish police went into the houses saying in broken voices, The time's come now. You've got to leave all this. The Hungarian police struck out with truncheons and rifle butts to right and left, without reason, indiscriminately, their blows falling upon old men and women, children and invalids alike. One by one, the houses emptied and the street filled with people in bundles. By ten o'clock, all the condemned were outside. The police took a roll call, once, twice, twenty times, the heat was intense, sweat streamed from faces and bodies. Children cried for water. Water? There was plenty close at hand in the houses, in the yards, but they were forbidden to break the ranks. Water, mummy! Water! The Jewish police from the ghetto were able to go and fill a few jugs secretly. Since my sisters and I were destined for the last convoy and we were still allowed to move about, we helped them as well as we could. Things are happening quickly now. Eli is saying his daily prayers when suddenly the Gestapo officers announce that it's time for the Jews in the ghetto to get ready for deportation. The Jews leave their homes and give up almost everything they own, including expensive rugs, candlesticks, and even Bibles. Everyone must stand in line to be counted over and over again for hours in the blazing heat. People who don't obey are beaten with rifle butts and truncheons, which must be some kind of hard, heavy stick, like a police officer's nightstick. Even children and old people get beaten. Ellie is praying when the police come, but when he hears them, he immediately tears himself from his prayers and runs to the window. Seems like lately, he's not praying with the same passion as before. I think the events that are happening in the world around him are starting to pull him away from the private, spiritual world where he used to spend so much time. These days, he is really busy helping the other villagers before he and his sisters leave with the last group, or convoy, of Jews. Let's continue reading after the space on page 14, where it says, Then, at last, at one o'clock... Then, 
At last, at one o'clock in the afternoon, came the signal to leave. There was joy. Yes, joy. Perhaps they thought that God could have devised no torment in hell worse than that of sitting there among the bundles in the middle of the road beneath a blazing sun, that anything would be preferable to that. They began their journey without a backward glance at the abandoned streets, the dead, empty houses, the gardens, the tombstones. On everyone's back was a pack. In everyone's eyes was suffering drowned in tears. Slowly, heavily, the procession made its way to the gate of the ghetto. And there was I on the pavement, unable to make a move. Here came the rabbi, his back bent, his face shaved, his pack on his back. His mere presence among the deportees added a touch of unreality to the scene. It was like a page torn from some storybook, from some historical novel about the captivity of Babylon or the Spanish Inquisition. One by one, they passed in front of me, teachers, friends, others, all those I had been afraid of, all I once could have laughed at, all those I had lived with over the years, they went by, fallen, dragging their packs, dragging their lives, deserting their homes, the years of their childhood, cringing like beaten dogs. They passed without a glance in my direction. They must have envied me. The procession disappeared round the corner of the street. A few paces farther on, and they would have passed beyond the ghetto walls. The street was like a marketplace that had suddenly been abandoned. Everything could be found there. Suitcases, portfolios, briefcases, knives, plates, banknotes, papers, faded portraits. All those things that people had thought of taking with them, and which in the end they had left behind. They had lost all value. Everywhere rooms lay open, doors and windows gaped onto the emptiness. Everything was free for anyone belonging to nobody. It was simply a matter of helping oneself. An open tomb. A hot summer sun. The scene that Ellie just described was really sad. As the villagers walk past him on their way out of Siget, Ellie can hardly believe what he's seeing. With everyone gone, the ghetto looks like an abandoned marketplace. Because they were forced out so quickly, the villagers had to leave many valuable items behind. These things now lie on the streets outside people's homes as if they were being put up for sale. But there is no one left to buy them, and the items have lost all value anyway, because their owners are headed for a place where money and belongings don't matter. Ellie says the abandoned ghetto is like an open tomb or grave. What do you think he means? Well, for one thing, the place is now silent and deserted like a tomb. But in a deeper sense, Ellie could also mean that the lives the Jews of Siget once enjoyed are now over. The ghetto has become like a grave for a way of life that's now dead. Let's continue on page 15 with, We had spent the day fasting. We had spent the day fasting, but we were not very hungry. We were exhausted. My father had accompanied the deportees as far as the entrance of the ghetto. They first had to go through the big synagogue where they were minutely searched to see that they were not taking away any gold, silver, or other objects of value. There were outbreaks of hysteria and blows with the truncheons. When is our turn coming? I asked my father. The day after tomorrow. At least, at least, unless things turn out differently. A miracle, perhaps. Where were the people being taken to? Didn't anyone know yet? No, the secret was well kept. Night had fallen. That evening we went to bed early. My father said, Sleep well, children. It's not until the day after tomorrow, Tuesday. Monday passed like a small summer cloud, like a dream in the first daylight hours. Busy with getting our packs ready with baking bread and cakes, we no longer thought of anything. The verdict had been delivered. 
That evening, our mother made us go to bed very early to conserve our strength, she said. It was our last night at home. I was up at dawn. I wanted time to pray before we were expelled. My father had got up earlier to go and seek information. He came back at about eight o'clock. Good news, it wasn't today that we were leaving the town. We were only to move into the little ghetto. There we would wait for the last transport. We should be the last to leave. At nine o'clock, Sunday scenes began all over again. Policemen with truncheons yelling, All Jews outside! We were ready. I was the first to leave. I did not want to see my parents' faces. I did not want to break into tears. We stayed sitting down in the middle of the road as the others had done the day before yesterday. There was the same infernal heat, the same thirst. But there was no longer anyone left to bring us water. I looked at our house, where I had spent so many years in my search for God, in fasting in order to hasten the coming of the Messiah, in imagining what my life would be like. Yet I felt little sorrow. I thought of nothing. Get up! Count off! Standing, counting off, sitting down, standing up again, on the ground once more, endlessly, we waited impatiently to be fetched. What were they waiting for? At last, the order came. Forward! March! My father wept. It was the first time I had ever seen him weep. I had never imagined that he could. As my mother, she walked with a set expression on her face, without a word, deep in thought. I looked at my little sister, Tsipora, her fair hair well combed, a red coat over her arm, a little girl of seven. The bundle on her back was too heavy for her. She gritted her teeth. She knew by now that it would be useless to complain. The police were striking out with their truncheons. Faster! I had no strength left. The journey had only just begun, and I felt so weak. Faster! Faster! Get on with you, lazy swine! yelled the Hungarian police. It was from that moment that I began to hate them, and my hate is still the only link between us today. They were our first oppressors. They were the first of the faces of hell and death. We were ordered to run. We advanced in double time. Who would have thought we were so strong? Behind their windows, behind their shutters, our compatriots looked out at us as we passed. At last we reached our destination. Throwing our bags to the ground, we sank down. Oh, God. Lord of the universe, take pity upon us in thy great mercy. The Little Ghetto Three days before, people had still been living there, the people who owned the things we were using now. They had been expelled. Already we had completely forgotten them. The disorder was greater than in the Big Ghetto. The people must have been driven out unexpectedly. I went to see the rooms where my uncle's family had lived. On the table there was a half-finished bowl of soup. There was a pie waiting to be put in the oven. Books were littered about on the floor. Perhaps my uncle had had dreams of taking them with him. We settled in. What a word. I went to get some wood. My sisters lit the fire. Despite her own weariness, my mother began to prepare a meal. We must keep going. We must keep going, she kept on repeating. The people's morale was not too bad. We were beginning to get used to the situation. In the streets, they even went so far as to have optimistic conversations. The Bosch would not have time to expel us, they were saying. As far as those who had already been deported were concerned, it, it was too bad. No more could be done. But they would probably allow us to live out our wretched little lives here, until the end of the war. The ghetto was not guarded. Everyone could come and go as they pleased. Our old servant, Martha, came to see us. Weeping bitterly, she begged us to come to her village where she could give us a safe refuge. 
My father did not want to hear of it. You can go if you want to, he said to me and to my older sisters. I shall stay here with your mother and the child. Naturally, we refused to be separated. Night. No one prayed so that the night would pass quickly. The stars were only sparks of the fire which devoured us. Should that fire die out one day, there would be nothing left in the sky but dead stars, dead eyes. There was nothing else to do but to get into bed, into the beds of the absent ones, to rest, to gather one's strength. At dawn there was nothing left of this melancholy. We felt as though we were on holiday. People were saying, who knows? Perhaps we are being deported for our own good. The front isn't very far off. We shall soon be able to hear the guns. And then the civilian population would be evacuated anyway. Perhaps they were afraid we might help the guerrillas. Oh, if you ask me, the whole business of deportation is just a farce. Oh yes, don't laugh. The boss just want to steal our jewelry. They know we've buried everything and that they'll have to hunt for it. It's easier when the owners are on holiday. On holiday? These optimistic speeches, which no one believed, helped to pass the time. The few days we lived here went by pleasantly enough, in peace. People were better disposed toward one another. There were no longer any questions of wealth, of social distinction and importance. Only people all condemned to the same fate, still unknown. Okay. Ellie's family has moved from the big ghetto to the little ghetto. As Ellie looks for the last time at his childhood home, the place where he first said his prayers and asked God questions, he claims he's not sad to be leaving. But everyone else in his family is very upset. In fact, for the first time in his life, Ellie sees his father cry. So I wonder whether Ellie is just blocking out his feelings of shock and pain. Ellie says the Jews in the little ghetto have been making optimistic speeches about how maybe they're being deported for their own good. So optimistic must mean positive or hopeful. But Ellie also says that secretly, no one really believes the optimistic speeches. Like always, the people want to believe that things aren't really that bad. But by now, they all know that they're just pretending they're okay. Ellie also points out that nobody cares about wealth or class anymore, that it doesn't matter. I think what he means is that no matter whether they are rich or poor, respected or not, all of the Jews of Siget are going to be deported. The same thing is going to happen to them all, or as Ellie says, they are all condemned to the same fate. If you're not sure what condemned means, it's like being sentenced, as in a trial, to a terrible punishment. Let's read on, starting after the space on page 19, with Saturday, the day. Saturday, the day of rest, was chosen for our expulsion. The night before we had the traditional Friday evening meal, we said the customary grace for the bread and wine and swallowed our food without a word. We were, we felt, gathered for the last time round the family table. I spent the night turning over thoughts and memories in my mind, unable to find sleep. At dawn we were in the street, ready to leave. This time there were no Hungarian police. An agreement had been made with the Jewish council that they should organize it all themselves. Our convoy went toward the main synagogue. The town seemed deserted. Yet our friends of yesterday were probably waiting behind their shutters for the moment when they could pillage our houses. The synagogue was like a huge station, luggage and tears. The altar was broken, the hangings torn down, the walls bare. There were so many of us that we could scarcely breathe. We spent a horrible twenty-four hours there. There were men downstairs, women on the first floor, it was Saturday. It was as though we had come to the service. Since no one could go out, people were relieving themselves in a corner. The following morning, we marched to the station where a convoy of cattle wagons was waiting. 
The Hungarian police made us get in, eighty people in each car. We were left a few loaves of bread and some buckets of water. The bars at the windows were checked to see that they were not loose. Then the cars were sealed. In each car, one person was placed in charge. If anyone escaped, he would be shot. Two Gestapo officers strolled about on the platform, smiling. All things considered, everything had gone off very well. A prolonged whistle split the air. The wheels began to grind. We were on our way. Well, we finally reached the end of a really tough first chapter. A lot has happened, and after months, even years, of trying to pretend that life will soon return to normal, the Jews of Siget are finally beginning to realize that nothing will ever be the same again. Although they still don't know exactly where they are going, we know from the introduction that they are headed to a concentration camp. Unfortunately, we also know that things will only get worse from here.